think I'm going to close the door just in order to not disturb the recordings. Um, Everybody that enters and leaves is going to go to the base. Sorry? Everybody that enters and leaves is going to go to the base. Okay, hurry up, you're to blame. We should start exactly at 8.45. So. Okay, um, so this one part is going to be more official than the rest because it's going to be recorded. So everybody in the room behave yourself during the recordings because there's a microphone directed towards you. <laughs> and you only can ask very smart questions. Uh, so Esten is first going to start with his webinar and then we have a short break and then we have another lecture. Right? So. All right, thank you, and uh, good morning. Are you ready for another long day of lectures? <laughs> I'm going to give you two. Uh, so first, the webinar, as Chris uh, said, and then I'm going to do uh, a talk on mathematical models and uh, measurements. And uh, I, I prefer to have the webinar actually here with you guys. You see your face, face, you all look really good. So. And, uh, and also there's an overlap between the, the talks. I'm going to mention accelerometers here. In the second lecture, I talk about how we use simulation models of the accelerometer uh, to understand what is actually measured. So uh, that will save us some time and, and be some synergies. The title of this seminar is uh, very broad, um, so I've limited to uh, a few topics that I think would be uh, useful for you to hear about, uh, listed here. And I'll start with pressure catheters and pressure measurements. So most of you are engineers, I suppose, uh, and uh, so you will understand the question when you see this uh, pressure waveform. What is the frequency content of this uh, signal? And how is the sampling rate we need to accurately reproduce uh, this uh, waveform? And just a reminder for those who may not be engineers here, this is the famous Fourier theorem that states that for any periodic signal, it can be decomposed into a sum of pure sinus waves. Uh, so the first sinus wave has the base frequency or the first harmonic, it's the frequency in this case of the heart rate. And the second the sinus wave has to double that frequency and the third has the third and so on until infinity. But you don't, in practice you don't have to add infinitely amount of sinus waves. There's a certain limit to the sinus wave you have to add and what's the highest frequency? It's, it's kind of frequency content. So for this left ventricular pressure waveform, what's the number of sinus wave we have to add to reproduce this accurately? Here's the zero harmonic, that's the average, which the sinus wave oscillates around. And here's the first sinus wave. You see already there, it starts to mimic the actual waveform. And I have a second harmonic, so this has twice, uh, twice the frequency here. You see the amplitude? is 57 on the first and then it's 25 you add the third and the fourth you see the amplitude now it's smaller and smaller but we're approaching a true waveform and if you repeat this exercise up to 11 harmonics you get a pretty accurate uh, reproduction of this waveform and you will just notice the amplitude here goes from 57 and after 9 is less than 1 so I would say after 12 or maybe 15 to, to Exaggerate of it, you actually don't need more sinus waves. So this frequency content of this signal is up to, let's say, 15 harmonics to be safe. So my question to you then is, you know the sampling theorem. You need to uh, sample with at least twice the frequency of the signal. That's the Nyquist theorem. So what's the sampling frequency in hertz required to sample this signal? That's a slight tricky question. And you're on camera. So, <laughs> so you said 15th harmon harmonic. Exactly, harmonics, that's a keyword. And Hertz is a second. And this one, by chance, has uh, one second uh, period. So you're lucky. It's the frequency uh, content here is one Hertz, so that means the 15th harmonic is 15 Hertz. Times two. Times two, so you need at least 30 Hertz. Yeah. Right, that's Typical for you, what about the mice? But, but, but <coughs> at exercise, you need a higher frequency. True, you're very true. So when you have high frequency, like in the mouse, that has, we heard yesterday, six 
200 speeds per minute. That's uh, twice, uh, 10 times what we have here. So we need uh, that's the frequency content that is at 150 hertz. So we need at least 300 hertz. Right. So be aware of the, the heart rate. Right. In order to measure pressure, we have uh, two types of catheters. Uh, shown here, it's a fluid filled catheter and a micro tip catheter. So the fluid filled catheter is uh, a thin uh, plastic tube uh, filled with fluid, of course, and so the tip of the fluid at the tip here is in contact with the blood. So the catheter is inserted into the blood vessel or into the chamber where you want to measure pressure, and the fluid is in contact with the blood, so the blood pressure is transferred via this stationary fluid column that goes all the back, way back to the transducer here where it is, um, uh, the pressure is converted to an electrical signal. So this is a very easy and very much used uh, method to, uh, to measure pressure. But it has some uh, limitations. And one of them is that it's really hard to remove all the air bubbles in this fluid column. While fluid is incompressible and can transfer this pressure wave uh, more or less correctly, it's the, the bubbles are not incompressible, they compress easily. So when the pressure wave hits the bubble, the bubble compresses and expands and oscillates. So you kind of get a distortion of the pressure wave that you want to measure. And also the tube is not completely stiff. It has some compliance, kind of dampening effect. So effectively, the frequency response of this measurement system is, is low. You cannot sample uh, waveforms that oscillate rapidly with such a system. And the frequency response is not even flat, it may have some resonance frequency. So that distorts the resulting waveform. Microtip catheters, uh, on the other hand, they, there's a sensor is at the tip. So it converts the pressure directly at the tip uh, from a pressure to an electric signal. And it reproduces the waveform very accurately. So uh, you can have a frequency response here of many hundred hertz and sample at really high heart uh, rates. It's a very expensive uh, system usually compared to the liquid uh, fluid filled catheter. One comment is also that the fluid filled catheter also creates a delay because it's dependent on the length of the tube. Yes. But there's also a delay in the, in the signal. Yes, I forgot that point. Yes. You want to keep it as short as possible. Um, is it only delay or also damping? Sorry. Also delay. Also delay that thing, and also these bubbles. Yeah. So here you see a, a left ventricular pressure waveform by the two catheters uh, from the textbook, and it shows uh, that it, uh, the fluid field overshoots the true waveform. So you cannot trust the maximum or minimum value uh, on this pressure, and the, also the waveform and uh, the, the exponential decay during isolated relaxation is not accurately reproduced. So typically you want to ex calculate the exponential time constant tau of the uh, pressure pump, say something about how fast this part is relaxing. So these numbers are not really, cannot trust them with a fluid field. And unfortunately these are of course numbers that we are quite interested in measuring in, in you know, cardiac research. And by the way, this uh, I recommend uh, for those who are going to do uh, some pressure measurement. This uh, textbook, this chapter here is very really nice. Goes through a lot of uh, relevant problems and, and, and things with these measurement systems. So another thing with the uh, fluid fill is that the pressure at transducer needs to be at the same level that you measure uh, your tip of the catheter. So here, if you have the heart at this height, you have to have the transducer at the same height. Over here. It's connected to the blood uh, to the table, and that's a very quite common mistake. You just want to go to where it's easy to fix it, but that actually generates a vertical fluid column. So uh, I think it's four centimeters of uh, water is equal to about three milliliters of mercury. So that makes a difference, and particularly if you want to measure the left atrial pressure, that's of clinical interest because it reflects the pressure required to fill the ventricle. And if you have a heart failure and congestion, so the blood is like congested back into the atrium and lungs, <coughs> this uh, pressure is elevated. And if you have more than 12 or 15 millimeters in the left atrium, it's considered heart failure. So you can misdiagnose 
uh, if you don't do this accurately. So you have to be aware, but many uh, uh, things you have to be aware of when you do these missions. So uh, yes, but uh, the the problem I didn't mention with Microtik, they can reproduce the waveform accurately, but the main problem with uh, this is is drifting. It's just electronics. So for instance, temperature is quite sensitive to temperature. You calibrate it in, in the air temperature and then you put it into body 37 degrees. You change your temperature and it will drift. Uh, so the, the zero level will be difficult to really trust. So while the fluid gathers from drift much less or, and it's very easy to correct for this drifting, you just take the switch, put it to air and zero balance the transducer and you're fine. And so in our lab, we actually use the fluid fill catheters as reference to the microtip catheter. So we use um, periods where there is no change in pressure during the heart cycle. It's flat, so we don't have these problems with oscillations and artifacts. So there, uh, we, in our recordings, we introduce an extra systolic beat. And what happens then is that we have a very, very long diastasis period in the following diastole. So that's where the plant pressure is flat. We take then the average of this phase, part of this uh, black region, and the average here is of the fluid field is 7.3, and we have then in the eight microtip is 13, so we can then just <laughs> drift correct the microtip patterns. So I think this is kind of gold standard way of actually uh, doing this. All right. Um, you probably heard the terms right heart catheterization, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, so on God's catheter. I'm sure how many of you know actually what that is. But you're gonna be exposed to this term when you read the papers, right? So first is let's say take the difference between right heart catheterization and left. Left heart catheterization is what we usually want. We want to make sure most of us are interested in left ventricle. So to do that, you stick a catheter into the artery, through the aortic valve, and into the ventricle. The problem with that is that some patients may have a calcification and plaque. So you, you have a risk of actually knocking loose some plaque. And that goes into the ventricle, and be ejected into the bloodstream, can go into your coronary artery and up to your brain and cause a stroke. So this may be one out of 1,000 patients get a stroke from this examination. So that is rarely done, unless you uh, think it's very really beneficial for the patient to have these measurements. Right heart catheterization going on the right side. So this, this doesn't have the same risk. It's very limited to the risk of this. It's done in many more patients. You go through a vein into the, uh, with the fluid field catheter into the right atrium and you're recording there of the pressure in the right atrium. You continue inserting it into the right ventricle right ventricle pressure waveform, and then you continue on through the pulmonary artery, uh, pulmonary uh, valve, and into the pulmonary artery to measure the pressure there. And then we push further all the way into these pulmonary arteries to the uh, capillary until it gets stuck because the vessels are so small. So that's gets vegged. And the nice thing about this is it has this uh, balloon. So it, you blow up this balloon and you prevent blood flow coming from the back. So now you actually generate a stationary fluid column all the way effectively to the three lungs to the left atrium. This elegant way is you have now a stationary fluid column from the left atrium all the way back to the transducer. So you can actually measure the uh, left atrial or get an estimate of left atrial pressure for this method. That's quite cool. This is what they call the pulmonary capillary bench pressure, or maybe a new term and to take over is pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. Okay. Um, pericardial pressure is maybe, uh, I'll skip for the sake of time, but I think we in Oslo are maybe the only group in the world and one in Canada measure pericardial pressure. We put this flat, uh, this contains a little bit of fluid put it in between the pericardium and the wall and can then pick up the pressure uh, uh, generated by the pericardium on the wall. But uh, this is, you can ask me a question if you want to know more about this. So, go to solar micrometry. 
solar sound, my coin is small. This is small ultrasound crystals that you can put into the uh, muscle, you insert it into the muscle. So you only do this in animals, you never do this in patients. And uh, we have, when you have large animals, uh, you typically you use two milliliters crystals, or three. So one such crystal can send a sound wave, or, or it can actually hear a sound wave. So, and the time it takes from this crystal to send the sound and to the other one who receives it, the time it takes is proportional to the distance between the two crystals. So you can then record the distance between multiple crystals. One can send and then all the other crystals can uh, measure the time it takes from the sound to reach them and then you have the distance between them. And they can both send and sound, so you can go both ways. This one can send and this one can send. Uh, some crystals you can also get them with electrodes. So you can pick up the electrical wave uh, that propagates through the tissue. So you can, uh, it's kind of a regional ECG, so you can find the timing that this uh, piece of tissue is, uh, is activated. So this uh, slide shows uh, a heart after the experiment. We, we of course put in a crystal in a beating heart, but just uh, we have this dissected the heart here after the experiment just to show you uh, one experiment where we placed it on the outside heart. You can also insert it into the sub according to channels and so on. So this, uh, I'm going to show you a uh, little movie here from Monday. We have an expert Monday, so this is a recording uh, or a video from the lab. Here we see the oscilloscope. And I see, uh, so this, this is actually when the uh, sound is sent out, and this is the time. So here's the sound picked up, so you see how it moved between two crystals. So this is the sound wave. And here you see um, the display showing uh, the ECG here. This is crystal two sending and one receiving. So you see the length changes between those crystals. This is the other way around. And here's between the one crystal one, three, one, four, and so on. So you have all this length that we can measure when we have, I think it's about nine crystals in this large. And here you see the uh, pressure and also the electromyogram. This is electrodes. So placed in the anterior wall, septal wall, the cerebral lateral wall. See and they're kind of synchronous in this case. Um, and also, we can calculate the volume from these uh, crystals. So if you measure some diameters in heart, you can multiply those diameters and get an estimated volume. And that gives you the opportunity to measure pressure volume loops in real time. So here you have the volume on the x-axis and pressure here. And you can also put a segment length here if you want to have regional uh, precious segment length loops. And we're now doing a cable constriction. So you can see the change in real time. Every heartbeat gets smaller and smaller as the volume into the ventricle is reduced. And you can do, you can see the end of pressure modulation. So all this, you can see in the lab in real time, uh, the effect on the pressure volume loop of your interventions. Another cool thing with these crystals is, well, they, they measure just the distance between them, but by some mathematical tricks, you can actually uh, find a position space and get the 3D coordinates. But you have to do some assumption, you have to say this crystal is fixed, which is not true, but then you can measure it relative to the motion relative to that. So just show you an example from uh, one of uh, the experiments we did, where we, we searched like, a bunch of crystals around the mitral ring here, and one in the apex. And we also had three crystals uh, fixed to this plastic ring that we uh, sutured underneath the heart. So this is like our fixed, non-moving crystals. So we could reference the motion relative to that. Um, and this is the program that uh, shows uh, after this analysis. This is the APO crystals. These are the three crystals that's on this ring that's fixed. And this is the crystals around the mitral ring. I've drawn some white lines between them, just to, for illustration here. And you can kind of see how this moves in 3D space. So this is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I always thought that the valve ring was going to be rigid. Yeah, that's not true, is it? And it's uh, quite, this is what exactly this project was about, to see how this valve ring deformed uh, and, and also during different loading conditions and so on. So, uh, I'll stop this. This is 
not my field of expertise. There was a surgeon doing this, but uh, I was helping out the crystals. So you can read the paper if you're interested. <laughs> okay. So, another uh, sensor, electromagnetic tracking. Anyone familiar with that? You know what it's normally used for? It's uh, typically used uh, in surgery or, or what I know the use of this is in minimal invasive surgery where you want to track uh, your instruments inside the body. Where's the position? So that's the normal, uh, most used as far as I know. And you have this um, transducer that generates an electromagnetic field in a room. And these are the catheters. So it has a coil, so you can then know the position relative to the transducer in space. Okay. So we want to test this on um, in hearts, see if we can, because uh, we had this idea could improve cardiac resynchronization therapy. And uh, uh, Ali showed this uh, slides uh, yesterday, uh, where you have a left bundle rush block, where the left bundle is, uh, is uh, blocked. So we, the high speed uh, conduction system is, uh, <coughs> is blocked. You have to take the dirt roads to get to the left angel, and it will take you forever to get there. And you can resynchronize and by putting an electrode on the septum and on the lateral wall and activate them at the same time and then you re resynchronize. So our idea was that um, could we actually use electromagnetic tracking to, to improve cardiac resynchronization therapy. So as you put these electrodes on these two uh, sites, if you add a coil so that you can track the position of these electrodes, then you can get direct feedback on uh, the position or the motion of these two, you can uh, actually estimate the, the diameter between here. And that could give you some functional feedback on this uh, pacing that we do. So uh, we want to test that. We, we didn't have the such a combined sensor, but we do the best next next thing. We had the normal electrodes, and then we place these electromagnetic uh, sensors next to them uh, inside the arch, and we also put these crystals. Um, so the micrometric crystals to measure the diameter by that as a reference. So here you see a picture from one heart on the outside. We have the normal <coughs> epicardial pacing lead, then the crystal uh, next to it, and this is the electromagnetic tracker uh, catheter that's sort of next, next to each other. It's kind of mimicking such a system. And the same thing in set. So here you show the uh, the this, this has a position space, and of course, then you can derive distance between them. So, we have measured the EMT electromagnetic tracking and compared to the somatic reference, and you can see it accurately uh, reproduces diameter. And then we introduced left bundle rush block, which caused a normal deformation, and then applied CRT that kind of normalized this uh, diameter. Of course, this is the sunshine story. The first experiments they failed. Uh, or I should say we got negative results, which were interesting. We used the most common uh, electromagnetic system that was available on the market. It has a sampling rate of 40 samples per second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that should be uh, good enough for a uh, pressure rate. <coughs> of course, these animals had a heart rate of 120, and, and as uh, the wave shape here is, uh, is more complex, so it has, uh, you need a higher sampling rate. So that was a lesson. And we now uh, got the whole lower so they got up to 500 samples per second, and then that's why we got these results. So that was that was interesting. <coughs> and the reason why EMT is always lower? I think to track navigate uh, surgical equipment, uh, where a surgeon doesn't move it that fast. <laughs> uh, I'm guessing. I don't know, but that was uh, depending on the use. And then, so in order to use it for this purpose, you need higher sampling rate. So. It's a, that was a message, I guess. All right, so the final topic, I think, is inertial measurement units. It's an accelerometer, and it can also include uh, gyros, gyroscopes, and magnetometer. And these are, are actually available in sensors today. This is the Medtronic, kind of located here in the city, I think. It has this micro electrode. Uh, and the same is Sonar, which from Lee Van has been around for many years already. And I want to 
advertise from uh, our company, Star Company, and I'm a shareholder, so I have some conflicts of interest here. <laughs> I have to declare those. Uh, but uh, this is a traditional uh, pacing lead. We say, why not put an accelerator into this pacing uh, lead so you can get more information? So uh, the idea for, uh, for us is that a patient that goes through cardiac surgery, they open the chest, they stop the heart to do surgery, and then they want to restart the heart. And when they restart the heart, they sometimes have problem getting a, a regular rhythm. So these patients need some help from temporary pacing over a period. So the, always the cardiac surgeon implant these, uh, these electrodes. <coughs> I'll show you the movie here. So uh, after the surgery or during surgery, the cardiac surgeon to suture it to the heart here. Then the lead goes through the chest wall, it's kind of a, and into, uh, so this is the uh, pacemaker that paces, but we suggest also having this monitor that monitor the motion to so give you some functional feedback also. So you get the two for the price of one. And then when the patient leaves the hospital, you just draw the wire and it uh, sets a loose from the heart and the patient can leave. So this is just temporary for a few days after surgery. And then you can monitor the motion and, and get some functional uh, information. Oops. Um, yes, here's a, we do a series of, of animal experiments on this, a few patient studies. So just an example of what this may be useful for. is here we an animal with a during baseline, after we have introduced ischemia in the, uh, in the heart. You can see the acceleration signal, uh, kind of complex, but if you integrate the velocity and twice to the displacement, you can clearly see that it changes motion. So this could give some functional feedback as well. So I think these sensors can, can help uh, give it yeah, useful. All right, so that's actually the uh, Close to the webinar, and uh, these are the topics going through. If you have any questions, okay. well, thank you. you. Questions? I have at least one comment about the crystals. Yes. Because they seem very experimental, but as nowadays a new a mapping system with eight splines, which is now being put into the H left atrium for ablation purposes, where they have 48 electrodes and 48 sonar micrometer crystals, oh, okay. which is meant to, to measure basically the size of the atrium, nothing more. And then with the electrodes, they uh, extrapolate to the wall of the atrium to get electrical maps. But you can also imagine that you measure the wall motion. And actually, I know some people who want to put this one in the ventricle and then measure the electromechanics uh, at the same time in, in real time almost. Uh, but that, that application hasn't been developed by the company, but it's in those crystal signals like you showed. So that's, that can be interesting. And about the, uh, your company, uh, <laughs> so you get absolute displacement but wouldn't that be dependent on the position of the body and the heart? Because uh, and the, 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 just this placement may be dependent on your laying or your right or your left side or something like that. Uh, I'll, I'll actually get to that in the next lecture. Okay. Uh, so for that, okay. uh, yes, but it. Uh, <coughs> so uh, we'll see that. Maybe that's your question. Okay. Yeah. Or you want to have two of them so you can really measure a short. Yeah, so you measure the, the acceleration at one point of the heart yeah. at that time, yes. You don't have a deformation, you just have a no. motion, yes. I'm understanding better these differences between cath field and uh, wires for sensing pressure. Uh, I, was, uh, I was surprised at how big the difference can be. But I can imagine that those differences will depend on your actual choice on the, on the wire, your actual choice on the cath field. In your experience uh, with the setup that you have, it, do you really need to get to the? So do you, do you see so big differences? Because in your experimental setup, you said you have both the wire and the cuff to calibrate the wire with the cuff. Bill, do you see those big differences really happening in your experiments, or even bigger, even smaller? 
or uh, the, the point is that if we are building our functions and we make the this practical choice, how can you give us a recipe of when these differences are really significant and when they are not, or are they always going to be there? I think uh, latter. You, you can. I, I would actually assume it will always be there. Sometimes you have C bold. I have. Uh, Microtip catheter and the fluid underneath each other, and they, they look exactly the same. But that's almost the exception. Uh, you have uh, be very careful trying to avoid bubbles, as I said. That, that's me trying every trick in the book to get out those bubbles, but you know, you have to flush them sometimes. And, uh, <coughs> my experience is that you do have the waveform is shaped differently. I mean, it could be made many reasons, they may not be exactly the same position. So what can hit the wall, cause matter of artifacts. But yeah, I, I would say I wouldn't trust a fluid filled catheter if, if your purpose is to get the wave shape correctly. They are very good for getting the mean pressure correct, and, and as I said, for drifting, they are uh, the, the gold standard. But if you want the waveform, you should use a micro tip, for sure. And the micro tip is a disadvantage of possibility to drift. Yeah. Uh, it's a series, and, and especially in diastolic ventricular pressure or atrial pressures, when you're measuring a you know, few millimeters mercury, you can easily get a drift of seven millimeters mercury in your nobody. <coughs> or when you're measuring ventricular and atrial pressures, and you want to see when the valves close and open, you can be way off in that sense. And so that calibration is extremely sensitive. Yeah. Yes, well, I didn't go through that, but the calibration procedure is. Uh, is something also is ways of doing it. The boxes come in zero and hundred. I don't trust those, so I uh, put them into a certain apparatus where I, I generate. We have a machine that generates the pressure, and you sample that no pressure. Then you take another pressure and a higher pressure and you sample that. So you have two pressures and two nodes. So that's the gold standard of actually calibrating. So yeah, and then for all these instruments, they have their limitations and. and, and or should say tricks and shortcomings. So I always recommend people to actually visit the lab, work in the lab that, that uh, does these measurements, gain experience. You, you're probably going to make a lot of the same mistakes that many people have done before you if you're going to do this by yourself. Go somewhere and learn from someone who has experience. Highly recommend it. Thank you. All right. Okay, I'll open the door and... Thank <laughs> you.